Welcome to the very first episode of Skin Check, where I'll break down uh, new skin cancer research and turn it into insights that you can actually use. This month, I'll review recent studies from the top dermatology journals and share what matters most for patients, for GPs, other doctors, and medical students. So in this first episode, we're looking at skin cancer risks that often go unnoticed. The long-term risks after hematological malignancies or blood cancers, melanoma in firefighters, subtle red flags and so-called low-risk pathology reports, and top research priorities for melanoma patients themselves. So hi, I'm Dr. Finbar McGrady. I'm a GP, now specialising in dermatology with a special interest in skin lesions and skin cancer. Wherever you are in clinic, in training, or managing your own skin health, this series is here to help keep you informed and one step ahead. So let's get started. Section one looks at blood cancer survivors and their skin cancer risks. So we often think of immunosuppressant drugs like those used after organ transplants as the main link between cancer and the skin cancer risk. But a large Dutch study published in the British Journal of Dermatology reminds us that the blood cancers themselves actually carry long-term risks too. Researchers followed over 210,000 patients with blood cancer, including leukemias, lymphomas, and myeloma. They followed them up for 30 years. None of them had any previous history of skin cancer when they were diagnosed. Skin cancer risk was between two and nine times more likely across all the types of blood cancers compared to the general population. And the highest risks were particularly seen in those with a cancer called chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL. For those patients, uh, risks of SCC were 4.4 times higher, melanoma 2.7 times higher, Merkel cell 9.3 times higher, and basal cell 2.6 times higher. And this wasn't a short-term spike. Those elevated risks persist for decades after the original diagnosis. But why does this happen? Well, blood cancers and their treatments, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, transplants, all weaken the immune system. That means that less immune surveillance and more chance of skin cancer to develop and grow. And for rarer types like Merkel cell carcinoma, that risk is also tied to a virus that most of us carry harmlessly. That's called the Merkel cell uh, polyoma virus. Now, in immunocompromised patients, it can turn cancerous. It's a powerful reminder for patients with blood cancers, even many years later, that sun safety and skin checks do matter. So our next section is about firefighters and their melanoma risks, their awareness, their exposure, and their action. Obviously, no one cho chooses to have a blood cancer, but some people do choose to become firefighters. And like many frontline jobs, firefighting comes with hidden health risks. And one of them is skin cancer, particularly melanoma. Now, until a firefighter came to my clinic a few months ago, I didn't fully appreciate this connection either. He'd booked in for a routine skin check and I found a BCC on his neck. But he wasn't surprised. He said, it's probably the job. And that stuck with me. So when I saw this new study in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, I paid attention. So research analyzed two years of data from the American Association of Dermatology's Spot Me screening program, comparing over a thousand Boston area firefighters with more than 100,000 member, members of the public. Now their aim was not just to look at risk, but also to behavior. And so do firefighters actually get screened more? Before we get into that, a quick look at what we already know. So Jalilian et al. in 2019 performed a meta-analysis reviewing case control studies and found that firefighters had a 21% increased risk of melanoma compared to the general population. That's a statistically significant occupational risk, likely driven by chemical exposure during uh, fire uh, fighting. Then another one following the, we the World uh, Trade Center disaster showed that firefighters were exposed to toxic dust and fumes and showed elevated risks of multiple uh, cancers across 14 years. And these included melanoma incidents and that suggested long-term effects of this complex exposure. Now, more recently, the University of Michigan uh, released a paper, the Urban uh, Wildfire Exposure. And this study showed that firefighters tackling those firefighters uh, where the homes were near forests experienced biological changes at a cellular level. They checked blood tests and it showed that immune suppression, disrupted DNA repair and gene activity linked to increased risk of cancer. 
So it's not just about external exposure, it's all about how the body responds to this over time. So in short, the evidence is stacking up. Melanoma is part of the occupational hazard of firefighting, but what about awareness? Are firefighters recognizing the risk and taking action? Well, that's where this new Spot Me study adds something fresh. So back to that Spot Me study, 82% of firefighters agreed to full body skin checks compared to just 59% of the public. The firefighters were younger, more likely to be male, and less likely to report tanning or sunbed use, yet had similar rates of suspicious findings of skin cancers. Now, among the firefighters between the ages of 51 and 60, firefighters had proportionally more suspected melanomas than the general population. So are firefighters more aware of their risk? Well, this data supports that they might be. They're showing up, they're asking the questions, and they're getting the checks done. And that's a win, that's a good thing. But it also means that we need to meet them with good care, recognizing the occupational risk, not brushing off their concerns just because it's a young, fit uh, man, but consider firefighters as part of the growing group of patients like outdoor workers, uh, blood cancer survivors, who need skin checks built into their routine care. Now, in the third section, we're going to look about uh, a study that made me rethink how we interpret low-stage squamous cell carcinoma skin cancers. Now, doctors who excise skin lesions will know that this kind of report exists. SCC, T1, well-differentiated, fully excised. Now, that sounds reassuring, and it usually is, but this new study, published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, is a reminder that even with early-stage skin cancers, we can miss important warning signs if we don't take a closer look. So firstly, what does T1 mean? Well, T1 is the earliest category in the Brigham and Women staging system. It means that the tumour is relatively small, uh, not too deeply invasive and looks well behaved under the microscope. So there are cases where we usually treat with surgery alone and the most part the outcomes are excellent. But here's the thing, the stage label doesn't always tell the whole story. So what was studied in this particular uh, study? Well researchers from 11 centres analysed 15,000 T1 SCC skin cancers and they wanted to know are there features that predict which of these supposedly low risk tumours might still behave badly by spreading, recurring or causing serious harm down the line. So the four uh, minor risk factors they found subtle clues that were red flags, but they didn't change the stage, still the stage T1. But when they occur together, they can seriously increase the risks and change the prognosis. So the things to look for are moderate differentiation, the tumour looks slightly abnormal under the microscope, size between one and two centimetres, not huge, but enough to matter. And then invasion into the fat, so a wee bit deeper, the tumour is growing into the subcutaneous fat tissue. And then nerve involvement of the tiny nerve, so-called small calibre perineural invasion. So uh, when a tumour is well differentiated, it still resembles normal skin under the microscope. Poorly differentiated cancers look really messy and aggressive. Moderate differentiation sits somewhere in the middle. And this study showed that even moderate changes might matter more than we first thought. So most T1 SCCs behaved well with only about 0.58% had serious outcomes like spread, recurrence or death. But if a tumour had three of the four minor risk fa factors that I've mentioned there, that risk jumped to over 5%. And that's higher than the typical risk for the higher uh, grade T2A tumours, which usually gets much closer follow-up. So in other words, these so-called minor factors add up to a more serious outcome. So the message is that your patient may have a low stage tumour, but if the pathology report mentions moderate differentiation and say it's 1.8 centimetres in diameter and there's a wee bit into fat or it's just touched on the edge of a small nerve, well then that's a red flag for closer follow-up. We're not changing the stage, but we might need to change our mindset. So the final uh, fourth uh, uh, study looks at shifting our focus now from data and pathology reports to people. We've made huge strides in melanoma care, immunotherapy, targeted drugs, early detection tools, but what do patients actually want us to focus on next? Well, a new study in the British Journal of Dermatology asks that very question, and it did something simple but profound. They listened to what people had to say. So researchers interviewed 20 people across England, all living with melanoma. And rather than asking them about treatment outcomes, they asked, 
what do you want researcher to prioritize? And they're answered formed into five themes and they're worth hearing. So the first theme was risk factors and preventions. So many patients felt that the public still misunderstands melanoma, especially when it comes to risk factors. One patient said, I'm constantly asked if I was a sun worshipper. I wasn't. I had one bad sunburn as a child and that is all. Now we know that childhood sunburns can increase melanoma risk, but imagine how frustrating it is to explain that over and over again. These patients also wanted more clarity on genetics, vitamin D and lifestyle that might affect their tumour outcome and better public education, especially for younger people and for schools. Now, the second theme was about delays in misdiagnosis and it was about timing and how the delays created real stress for people. We're in a permanent state of waiting. It's that uncertainty that causes a lot of anxiety, said one patient. And patients talked about long waits for diagnosis, unclear pathways and inconsistent communication. One concern that came up again and again was about GP knowledge. And now I don't know how much training my general practitioners get. Um, melanoma is on the rise. Maybe they need some more training or more support, as said by another patient. Well, I can tell you from my personal experience, when I was training as a GP, we didn't get a lot of training in dermatology at all, never mind skin lesions. I actually learned my skin lesion training while on, on sabbatical in Brisbane, Australia. Back then in practice, it was patient demand for skin checks that pushed me to look for more training and courses in this area. There were loads of great opportunities to learn in Australia. Now that experience is what led me to starting this channel and my own clinic to raise awareness and to help both patients and GPs recognize the early warning signs of skin cancer. So if you're still watching at this point it, and it's helping, helping you and helping others, please consider liking this video subscribing or sharing it with somebody who you think it will matter. That's how this information will reach more people. Now, some people also wanted research into speed up diagnosis with the help of AI, teledermatology and better triage. I've covered some of those in recent videos actually and I'll link them below in uh, the description. So the third theme was treatments and their side effects. People wanted to more research into which treatments caused which side effects and how drugs interact with each other. Whether stopping treatment is early, or sorry, whether stopping treatment early is safe. And one person asked, what surgical method gives the best cosmetic outcome? Grafts, stitches, or letting it heal naturally? That's the kind of practical human questions that doesn't always make it into research, but it really matters. The fourth theme was about follow-up after treatment. Several patients described feeling abandoned once the hospital visit stopped. They wanted clear advice about how to check themselves and how often to get scans or blood tests or what new, new tools might help like mole mapping or circulating tumour DNA testing. And they emphasised mental health. One person said there was a long wait for talking therapies but they really helped a lot. Now the final theme was about improving survival and interestingly it wasn't just about the drugs either. Patients wanted to know what lifestyle changes could help, what their actual prognosis looked like, how to live well not just longer. One said, my friend who survived changing, changed her diet, her exercise and everything, it made a huge difference. So these stories highlight how important the holistic side of care is. So this study doesn't just tell us what drugs to use, it tells us what matters to the people we treat. And often that's clarity, empathy and inclusion. So if you're a patient, your voice belongs in the research conversation. And if you're a doctor or a medical student, keep asking what matters most. So this month on Skin Check, we have seen that skin cancer risks hide in plain sight. Whether it's a blood cancer survivor, a firefighter, a supposedly low risk pathology report, or even within the unmet needs of melanoma patients. If you're a patient, stay sun safe, stay informed and get your skin checked. If you're a GP or medical student, these are stories worth remembering. Now I plan to be back next month with the next episode of Skin Check with more research and real world insights. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please comment below and let me know what you would like to see next time. And I'll see you in the next one.